Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Curtain with Majestic's Children's Theater. I'm Carly. I'm going to be the moderator again for today. I hope you all already had a chance to watch our recording of The Jungle Book. And right below this video, you will find our um, chat room. If you type in your questions there, I can relay them over to our cast and our director, Steve. And if programming like this is something that you value, please consider after this chat uh, making a donation to the Majestic Theater. It help support our theater and help support any future programs like this. And you can also email any feedback that you have to info at majestictheater.com. And right now, I would love to introduce our cast, The Jungle Book. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. Hello. 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 You hear me OK? See me OK? No. Yes, yes, I can yeah, see Steve. you. I can see you, Steve. <clears throat> OK, well, to everyone at home, thanks for thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Hope you had a chance to watch Jungle Book. It's still online. I think it will be available for the rest of the evening. And uh, it was a pleasure to put together. It was five years ago, believe it or not. Um, uh, and this was a wonderful cast. And I had a great time. And, and uh, you know, and I want to say off the bat, uh, uh, two of our cast members, Hannah and Nina, uh, couldn't be with us uh, here today. Uh, do I need to hit start my video, Carly? Is that the deal? I have something here. OK. Uh, yes, please. There we there go. We now go. we can see yeah. you. <laughs> so, so thanks to Hannah and Nina, who couldn't be here today, um, who were, were great in the show. And also, uh, my thanks to my writing partner, uh, Andrew Eaton, uh, for helping me adapt uh, you know, this fantastic classic uh, a literary classic from Rudyard Kipling, The Jungle Book, The Mowgli Stories, because there's more tales than just Mowgli, but everybody knows Mowgli. Uh, mm -hmm. So let, I want to just uh, turn it over to you guys. Let's go around as if it's the first rehearsal, uh, a meet and greet, and introduce yourself, say who you are, <clears throat> your name, who you played in the show, and what you're up to now, um, if you're still involved in theater, or if you're onto something else, but maybe keeping one foot uh, uh, in theater um, and how you are adapting to what's going on. Uh, I, I'm just going to go as I see it here, uh, Rocco. Hi, I'm Rocco Degree. I play Boldeo, the storyteller and narrator. I also play Shere Khan, the tiger. Um, I just finished a year of uh, being a theater major at Holyoke Community College. And right now during the pandemic, I'm just focusing on original music and cartoon animation. That's so cool. Nice. Thanks. Uh, Kaylee. Hi, uh, I'm Kaylee Flanagan, and uh, I played Raksha, the wolf mother, uh, Mowgli's adoptive human mother, and a monkey, of course. It's finished of my junior year at Nazareth College studying musical theater. Um, obviously, uh, different if I was in school hopefully would have been doing some cool productions, but um, I've definitely been enjoying the opportunities um, like this and um, just to, you know, develop the, the talents further and, um, you know, explore uh, different ways of sharing and encouraging people through music and theater. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kaylee. Uh, Nick Cummings. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Nick Cummings. Uh, I played Bagheera on the Panther uh, and one of the elders and the man at the beginning who lost Mowgli. Um, I wrapped <laughs> up. I was, yeah. <laughs> My starring role. Um, uh, so I just wrapped up at UMass Amherst with a triple degree in theater, English, and computer science. Wow. Um, I'm living out in Boston right now. Um, working on the computer science degree with web development in uh, Mass Mutual, but I'm also doing improv and playwriting on the side. Well, oh, great. Sheesh. Great. Here. Uh, let's see, Ani Rood. Hey, so I'm Ani, and I played Mowgli um, in Jungle Book, and um, I've been kind of going through its art and music. I'm in a band at my school, and I play the trumpet, so yeah. Yeah, I mentioned this last time uh, uh, yeah. that you used to have a trumpet teacher uh, who was uh, Don Rivero, who plays uh, bass in a lot of our uh, orchestra pits uh, at the yeah. theater. It's a small world. Uh, Joshua True. Hi, I'm Joshua True. Uh, I played Gray Brother, um, aka Mowgli's like wolf brother, and I played one of the monkeys. I don't know which one, if I had a name or anything. Um, monkey I, number five, whatever. Monkey number five, <laughs> one of the numbers. Mama. I just finished my freshman year at Dean College for musical theater. Um, and to, I'm going to sophomore year still for musical theater. Um, uh, to keep me busy, 
just been a lot of online stuff, just trying to keep busy. Uh, my teachers gave me a lot of kind of sources to kind of keep me practicing, you know, some sources to practice my vocals and all that stuff. And I've just been trying to reach out with friends and just hang out and really go over certain things that we learned throughout our time at Dean Star Bar. Great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Dan Kelly. Hi, uh, I'm Dan Kelly. Uh, I play Akila, the wolf father. I play his adopt Mowgli's adoptive father in Act Two, and I also play the Monkey King. Um, and I and last year I graduated from the the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, uh, New York, and then they asked me to be part of their acting company. So I did that until about January, which was awesome. And now I just I got cast in some stuff in New York, but that might not be happening. So I've just been kind of doing. Uh, just kind of online auditions and stuff and it's been it's been a, there's been an adjustment but uh it's yeah. it's been it's been fun <clears throat> great thanks dan uh uh cassie hi i'm cassie cloutier i played ka and a dancer and did some of the choreography i graduated in 2019 from marymount manhattan college with a degree in acting and i've been living and working in new york as an actor ever since so i'm excited to get back to that <laughs> Yeah, are we all? Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Giuseppe. Uh, I'm Giuseppe. I played Baloo and an elder, and um, I just finished my sophomore year at UMass Amherst. And um, I've been doing shows there uh, occasionally when I have time, so I'm I'm still in it. But um, yeah, that's about it. And to keep busy, all I've been doing is, you know, not not much playing games. You know, talking to people when I can, you know, there's really nothing, you, you know. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Okay, so that's uh, that's everyone. Oh, and I, I should mention, too, that uh, uh, our, our uh, production assistants at the time are Nikki Maldonian and Jake Ingram, and they, they did a couple on stage things. So I'd be remiss not to mention that uh, thank you to them for being willing to jump on stage uh, when needed, a monkey or a, a village elder or whatever. Uh, I think, you know, last time we did uh, Sleepy Hollow, I started off, I think, just by throwing it out to you guys. Uh, I know we had a nice conversation yesterday, brought up a lot of points at, I, that I think we'll get to naturally today uh, if we just uh, let this go with takes us. Uh, but I just want to throw it out to you guys. Uh, you know, any question at all or comment, uh, you can. it can be about the production itself, the costumes, sets, lights, all the, you know, the concretes, right? Or it can be about the story itself whether it's um, uh, our adaptation, whether it's the original Kipling uh, story, or it's uh, the 67 Disney cartoon, or there was a more recent uh, CGI remake, uh, and, and et cetera. So we can, we can comment on any of that stuff. Go ahead, guys, throw it out to you. Rocco. So your adaptation of this play is very similar to the original Jungle Book and you use a lot of lines directly from it, sometimes in different places. Yeah. And, for, and for this adaptation, you do also branch out into a lot of other resources and a lot of other versions of the story. But what is your process for making this adaptation? Well, Andrew and I spent two or three weekends. He was living in Boston at the time, so I'd drive out there and just stay the night. And uh, we would always start by it's just so important to me. I know a lot, some people in, in theater disagree with this, but then they kind of just, uh, bury their head in the sand when it comes to what other people do, whether it's a movie or, or on stage. But I like to use our resources, you know, in 2020 to our advantage and get on YouTube and see what's out there. So I think we YouTube some stage adaptations of it, though there aren't too many. Uh, we started with, we read the novel, of course, did a lot of underlining and talking about it. <clears throat> and then lines we like, things we like, you know, just so we can go back through and rec easily see, uh, find it. Um, yeah, and like you say, Rocco, it might be a line that some other character says in some remote part of the book that we're not even planning on using, but we like it and we think, where can that fit in elsewhere? We started in order with a 1930-something or 40-something Jungle Book movie, like the first big Hollywood production of Jungle Book. Um, and that was very helpful. Uh, then we watched... I guess the 67 Disney cartoon, uh, which is delightful. You know, the last uh, uh, cartoon that Disney, uh, Walt Disney was alive for, incidentally. And uh, then after that, there was a there was a live action, a true live action. Uh, I think Disney produced uh, Jungle Book from 1994. 
remember renting that as a kid and I enjoyed that. And the, the biggest takeaway, the thing I liked most about that adaptation was there's a whole section of him grown up in the village, learning the alphabet, struggling to adapt. It didn't just end with them going to the village like the cartoon. So I found that fascinating. Um, and the, I remember the first image I had uh, of this before writing was the idea of what if Shere Khan, because this doesn't even happen in the book, but what if Shere Khan goes into his, crawls into his bedroom window and is in his house. And I, you know, I pictured like a fireplace behind them and, you know, being all dramatic, didn't do that here, but, <laughs> uh, but I love that image of the idea of like the first act if Mowgli goes to the jungle, a human, he's the foreigner. And then the idea of when he's in the human world, the jungle comes to him, whether it's his friends or, or the enemy, right? And the idea of a tiger crawling through it, a child's bedroom window is so creepy, but I love that Mowgli is able to, he's so brave, he's, he looks him in the eye and says, I'm not afraid of you. So that image alone was, uh, I loved. And um, let's see, the most recent one, uh, live action or CGI Disney one, wasn't out yet. I think it came out a year later, so we beat them to the punch on that. But we can talk about that later. But yeah, that's what we did. We watched those. We just spent a day watching those movies, and we talked about we, what we liked and didn't like. And then, and then we write out a structure, kind of scene by scene. Um, and then once you have that, it's not it's not too difficult to just sit and, and bang the thing out. Once you have a structure. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we accomplished it, more or less. Cool. Yeah, Cassie. I would love to add on to that. Um, last time watching it, I was noticing that the two longer stories that are told is are the tiger, how the tiger gets his stripes, and yeah. Boldeo and the treasure. And I'd love to know how you decided to use those as the sort of narrative stories and the stories that were told, rather than just a part of the play. Okay, so well, yeah, we can get into Boldeo a little. So when we watch the 1930s or 40s uh, uh, movie. So Boldeo is a character in the in the book, in the Kipling book, uh, who when uh, Mowgli goes to the human village, he's kind of the big shot in town. Uh, I think it says that he always has a musket lying across his lap, which is interesting. Uh, what does that say about him, you know, that he's, he's he thinks he's powerful or something, or maybe it shows some, some insecurity. Uh, but anyway, and he's the, the village storyteller. Um, that character, I thought, very interesting, but it wasn't until we watched the the Hollywood movie where they used him as a storytelling device of uh, he's tell he's telling stories to the village and he's a very old man he looks ancient and he starts telling the story of Mowgli and I think it isn't the end that he reveals himself to have been Boldeo so he played a part in the story and I think whenever there's a whenever a narrator actually is a character that takes part in the story I find that fascinating whether it's the cricket and Pinocchio, right, mm -hmm. Dan Kelly, or like Salieri mm -hmm. and Amadeus. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. they, um, they talk about, uh, you know, as they narrate, it's like the story conjures up behind them from their memory because they were involved, you know. I just like that device in storytelling. Um, as far as how the, the tiger got its stripes, you're talking about that, Cassie? Mm -hmm. I just found that whole long section and it's 10 times longer on the, on the page than it is in our book. <laughs> really whittle it down. Maybe I could have whittled it down some more, I don't know. But uh, I just thought it was a really interesting story and it brings up these ideas of, of fear and bravery. You know, one of the biggest things with Mowgli is that he's brave. There he is there, standing oh. up for the tiger, oh. dead in the eyes, you know? Um, and um, yeah, I thought it'd be interesting to try and work that into the story. And again, mm. we were talking last time uh, during Sleepy Hollow about this theme of storytelling and passing stories down to people. And I, I liked having that idea. And I liked the idea of stopping in the middle of act two and having them just stop and tell a story. But I said, it, it's got to relate to the plot somehow. And I think it's in there in the sense that uh, he says, you got to look him in the eyes, but people are too afraid to do so. Um, so I like that the story, it seems long and it seems unrelated, but it seems very connected with Mowgli and the tiger and this idea of if you only look him in the eyes, if you stand up to him, uh, you'll find that he's, he's really afraid of you, you know? Um, so that's, that's, that's it there. Yeah. A anyone else? Yeah, Kaylee. Yeah. I, I mean, so obviously I had heard 
Rocco tell the story more in the show. Um, and I want to applaud Rocco for his brilliant telling of the story, but getting to hear it again with like fresh ears was really cool. Um, you know, and, and seeing that, like that story of how the tiger got his stripes, it's kind of the core of everything that the jungle book explores. Like, I mean, it, it juxtaposes fear and mercy and the choices that we have to, you know, stay trapped in fear or to show mercy and to kill fear because you see that the tiger thought he could kill fear, killed the man, but really kept fear alive. Um, and, and how interesting that is and, and the choices that Mowgli makes, um, you know, choosing to, I mean, he both shows Shere Khan mercy in, yeah. in, you know, keeping his adoptive father from killing any of the animals and, yeah. and, you know, choosing not to actually use the fire to harm him. Um, you know, and you see how, how that makes a difference and, and the, it's interesting too the humanity that he learns from the animals he's able to return back onto them and and that's a really cool thing and i also think a powerful thing um just to to hear in our world today where it's so easy to become uh, arrested by fear in this crazy time and, and to know that um, we have a choice to um, move with with mercy and with kindness and and that's what actually destroys fear so yeah one of the i mean the biggest one of the biggest things i love about the story is the character of, of Mowgli himself and that he is a child hero. He's a protagonist that is, um, you know, he's romantic in the sense that he's he has these qualities and we harp on him more in um, Little Princess and Aladdin when we start to say, because I, want, <laughs> I wanted, I didn't want to just connect uh, Little Princess and Aladdin to Jungle Book just by the character of Baldeo. I, I needed to show that there was some thematic connection. And the sense there is that Mowgli and Sarah Crew and Aladdin are all um, brave, they're kind, and um, the other quality is that they they use their mind, you know, and their how their mind is their most powerful weapon against people, coupled with with bravery on the one end uh, to stand up to, to people and things, um, and kindness, you know, to to allies, you know, and to friends. Anybody else? Oh my God. Um, so I believe I mentioned this, I asked this to my castmates, uh, for Sleepy Hollow, but, um, obviously with the characters being animals, which is, you know, an interesting character to embody, how did some of you guys kind of go about fitting in with the character? Like, I know I myself, I watched the Disney version, and I kind of, you know, I trying to, I kind of, even though it was, you know, an, an animated wolf, there were some ticks and fidgets here and there that he had that really showed him as, like, you know, a young, naive child, and I kind of put that into my, my acting for him. But what did you guys do? Go ahead, Rocco. Uh, for my character, I was a little inspired by the Disney version, but I, I decided to make him um, a little uh, cooler and meaner um, but really, it's all a mask. He's so insecure, and you can, like, tell that, like, he's, like, immediately, like, like, with the fire and him looking in the eyes, he'll middle- Shere Khan we're talking about. Yes, I'm yeah. talking about Shere Khan. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, day it was different. Um, and, um, I put, I put that, um, a lot, um, in the, in the stance. He's all, he's always leaning in a little bit. And a lot of that was also because of the beautiful, uh, masks that we had um it was a a head on top of a head and i remember constantly in the rehearsal process steve would be like rocco you got you got to look down it looks like shere khan's staring <laughs> off in his face the whole time um so that had a, a lot to do with the character he's kind of he's kind of just like this this bully kind of but he's um it's all it's all fake so, um, so I, I put I put that that coolness in the stance, and especially in his in his voice. And I can say this a lot about Baldeo too. But I think besides physical appearance, what you can really bring to the character to make it unique is the voice. That's the most mm -hmm. powerful. Mm -hmm. thing out. So especially in a lot of these Shones theater plays, I I play with the voice as much as I can, and try and make it as different um, from my own as possible. Anybody else on uh, uh, physicality animal? Uh, things like that, Dan. For for the Monkey King, uh, he's very much like a. I tried to do like a little Jim Carrey sort of like, <laughs> wacky, nice. crazy, mischievous sort of thing, but also kind of like a, uh, 
like I'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. Kind of like a like a <laughs> kind of swingling, Thanks. suave, smooth kind of uh, yeah. monkey king. Like, you know, like you're gonna help us, and then we're gonna help you. You know, like yeah, um, yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, and for the wolf, I I played a character the year previous uh, that was Mr. Fantastic Mr. Fox, mm -hmm. and uh, what Steve kept saying to me was, um, you know, he's like a superhero. Like he's like the breadwinner, the dashing. And so, although that character is a cat. <laughs> Uh, I mean, no. Well, oh. that character is like a dog, and like yeah. a fox and a wolf are kind of similar in that way. Um, there's also a point of like, he's also his bark's worse than his bite. You know, there's a part where like, uh, my wife like stands up for me <laughs> that I can't do. And I just go, yeah, you know, like yeah. uh, <laughs> just kind of humorous in that way. Um, and I think just kind of we all kind of like fed off each other in the way that like, oh, if Josh did something that I found interesting then I would do that and kind of like, we kind of molded our own kind of family mm -hmm. dynamic. Yeah, and the, and you know, the wife, the wolf mother standing up to Shere Khan and writing the book, but the the Dan Kelly going, yeah! <laughs> no, it's obviously a joke that we added and that gets the laugh, so. It's always fun when writing these to, you gotta throw in that joke every like five minutes and it's actually, it's actually not too hard to do because when you read something you know the novels on the serious side uh yeah it's fun to just throw in those little jokes you know and it can be as simple as that. <clears throat> yeah what she said you know basically and that gets a nice laugh in the in the recording yeah anybody else uh cassie i think it's interesting this is kind of going off of what dan said but how the animal physicality informed my character and so many people's characters like just the act of moving the snake and how it has to always be moving and sort of has to be yeah. fluid. It That very easily informed how I talked um, and how like the sort of tempting, moving, yeah. flexible nature of the snake. And I could totally see that in watching Dan's monkey and, and the tiger and the bear and you know, the sort of waddly nature of the bear. It kind of seems opposite of how you usually work as an actor to start from the animal's physicality and then build from there. But it was an interesting way to work. Yeah, yeah, you worked that puppet uh, beautifully, and I knew you had um, you're a dancer and had dance experience, so I thought that you'd uh, you'd excel at um, making that thing seem alive. And and correct, you know, if you ever watched um, Jim Henson on an old talk show, if he's got Kermit on his lap or or, or Ralph or whoever, uh, even when he's looking at the host the whole time, he's he keeps the character alive. He's mm -hmm. he's able to split himself and keep that that thing's eyes moving around. Um, and I noticed that Cassie on the video. I I, I, I watched the yeah, I can see the main action or the dialogue between say Mowgli or um, and, and Baloo, and in the background I can see the snake looking between them, uh, and it's always alive. So kudos. Thank Anybody you. else? <laughs> it was fun. Subject physicality, or do you want to move on to something else? Sorry, uh, I missed that. Can you repeat that, please? Do you want to? Uh, anything else uh, on that subject of animal physicality do you want to move on to something else carly i see you're here do we have a question i do uh we have a question from the audience great uh, uh katie she is reaching out to ani she says you were so good as mowgli i believe this was the first show you have ever done did you struggle learning all those lines that famous question <laughs> quick ani how old were you when we did this yeah so i think i was like seven or eight and um it was the first time i ever acted so it was kind of hard to memorize a ton of lines, um, but I just my mom helped me through it all, so it was, it was just, it got it got good at, at the end. Yeah, your your mom used to say that uh, you'd be in bed at night reading the script pretty much every night, even while we were performing, right? Yeah. Constantly looking it over, um, right? So there's no real secret to it. It's just looking it over and over and over, right? Yeah. Memorizing a phone number. Just, uh, it's kind of a thing you got to do, and once it comes, it comes. Yeah, and I almost think, too, when thinking about Kipling's language and how he orders words, like his, his, his precise syntax and, and precise vocabulary, that isn't too, too hard, it isn't, but it, seems, it has this elevated nature. But I actually think that's too, that's probably to your advantage, Ani, um, that it was so clearly written, you know? Lines like, what you will or will not do is not for you to say. That matter lies with me. You know, yeah. I just remember that, you know, I didn't and I'm not trying to. I just kind of remember that line. You know? <laughs> anything so else? Uh, anything else, guys? 
I just wanted to say, yeah. like, Ani, that, that was so incredible. Like, I, I was continually in awe and amazement of how you took that on and how you navigated it with, like, such courage and grace. And it wasn't even, like, like to an extent, like, I mean, you're a brilliant actor, but you didn't have to act because that's also who you are. Like, you are kind and you are brave. And, like, just, I think that's such a special thing. And, yeah. Just yeah, people, to say that. yeah, people people say oh, heroes like Mo you know cynics uh, don't like romantic literature. Heroes like Mowgli don't exist, but the fact that Ani came in and was able to do this is proof that mm. that they do. And yeah, I have to say, Ani, just have the the countenance of Mowgli on stage. Um, you're very just like stoic, but not. You, sometimes you have a little smile on your face, so it's not not like overly serious, and you're not out of it. You seem just very present. And I have to say, a lot of kids at seven or eight years old, a lot of kids at 15 or 16 years old will get on stage and they're just moving their feet constantly. Mm -hmm. And you were just grounded and you actually plant your feet. And I don't think I ever had to tell you, hey, stop shifting around, stop moving your feet. You just seem to plant yourself there confidently, whether you're aware of that or not, but I <laughs> have that quality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Josh. The points where... Oh. I just want to add on to the complimenting Ani train. Uh, <laughs> when I started, I when I started uh, Majestic, I was 12 years old and I was Pinocchio and Pinocchio, and I that it it uh, even at you know yeah, you were younger than me, but even at 12 years old, I was sitting there. There was definitely times where Steven had to tell me to stop shifting, or there were some lines that would just escape me. Like there was a line about a fruit, that I always forget. Mm -hmm. It was like the green thing. Um, so really props to you, Ani, for being so young, but really getting in there. And you, you had the, for not acting much beforehand, you had the spirit just to really get in there and work. And it was very, it was very good. I was very impressed. Um, and you're going to say something a second ago. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that like, as a, as like a preteen, as like kind of what, what Josh and like kind of maybe me and Kaylee were when we first started, like there's a lot of anxiety there. And like Ani, like even being younger than that, had none of it and like there was there were points where he was correcting us backstage on our lines because he knew it like back and forwards it's just like he was like a like no pun intended an animal because like, he just because he 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 knew the show it was like in his blood so like um yeah again hats on hey ani um how are you found to be in this play <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was just riding my bike, and then, um, I think, I don't know that, I forgot her name. Um, one of the workers at Majestic? Yeah, Aurora. Yeah, yeah, Aurora. Um, so I was just riding my bike with my friend, and then I used to live, like, right near Majestic, like, at the back, at an apartment. Mm -hmm. And then, um, this lady just walks right near me and asks, do you want to work at the Majestic? Do you want to act? And I was like... <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of felt scared. I was like, who is the stranger? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mom came up and she just asked a couple of questions. And so at first I was like, um, no, thank you. Oh. But then my mom was like, you know, you should kind of try it out. You know, you can, maybe you can find something you love. And I was like, okay, fine. And then, here I am today, still doing the gesture. Oh. Yeah, you still act, and you like to act, right? Right, Ani? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, yeah, I was insistent on, you know, I can just, I live in West Springfield, so I get a, a sense of our demographic, and there's no reason that Mowgli can't be an Indian American. I kind of had my heart set on that, you know, even if we had to go track you down in the street. <laughs> hey, uh, Nick or uh, Giuseppe, do you want uh, anything to, to add regarding... Uh, uh, character or physical uh physical I mean, or anything like that for me baloo was just me at the time like it still <laughs> is me in a way like he's just this like funny like lazy like <laughs> he's a loving like don't get me wrong like he's loving and like he, you know but it, that's it was just me so i <laughs> i i don't know it just it fit me and i was just being myself you just had the talk slower and he was the yeah. character already yeah the voice <laughs> yeah the voice was one thing but like just the act the, the character itself was that i was that was just so it was all it was all me like <laughs> Nick? um uh yeah with big gear it was really interesting exploring kind of 
two different physicalities depending on what worlds he was interacting with because i think amongst the animal world he was you know highly respected and very proud of his status in that environment and it was something that he was very sure of like he understood so he was always very stiff very had a tough exterior that he wouldn't let crack but around mowgli and around humans in general uh from something that he has a lot of trauma with being caged when he was very young um it was interesting to see how um that tough exterior would crack around mowgli that even though he had such a speckled past with humans that he still wants to fight through that trauma and choose to love mowgli yeah i love the uh those very interesting to see that sensitive and soft side yeah 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 i love that uh that element of the story um where bagheera uh, when trying to convince mowgli that he's got to go back home where he belongs that he says listen i too was not i was born in the wrong place i was kept in a cage uh indoors i didn't know what the jungle was but one day i realized i i saw the jungle outside a, an open window and that's where i belonged and i said to myself i'm Bagheera, right, the panther, and I broke the silly lock, and I went through the window, and I and now I, I found where I belong, and I'm comfortable. But I love that later on, you know, with this theme of kind of, uh, of prejudice and, and and grouping men all together that that some of the animals do, even Bagheera, who harbors this resentment against man a little bit. And I love how the villain Shere Khan goads him on and says, "How could you love a man after?" men did this to you and that's you know and that's just the great essence of a villain is that he thinks he thinks collectively like what does Mowgli have to do with you know the men who who cage Bagheera just because they're the same species you know there's like a specious uh prejudice going on in, in the in the story um and I love that yeah he gets so worked up that he almost he turns and almost hits Mowgli and stops and kneels and says I'm sorry I'm I'm confused uh, I think that's a beautiful moment, and I'm glad we had the, you know, Andrew and I were like, I want to have the guts to put this in there, because I know some people in the past would go, ah, I don't want to have, put this in a children's play, but I think it's very sweet and powerful, and I think on the recording, when he almost hits him, there's like a hush in the audience, and, and when Mowgli pats his head and says, brother, brother, it's so sweet. Yeah, anyway, um, any, anything else, a anybody on uh, any production element or any part of the story? at all yeah josh um so again similarly to sleepy hollow i just wanted to ask what was kind of the, the the thought behind the lighting and such like was it obviously you went in with the idea was it i because the jungle was all these like cool tones and cooler colors like you know in the jungle in the brush blues and green you know a little bit of sunshine and then the village was like bright and um, almost some some lights were almost not natural, like not natural colors. Um, I just wanted to know what was like the thought about behind all of it. Yeah, again, so the part of the framework of the script we said was that the first act is is the jungle and Mowgli, the human, you know, the outsider coming into it, and then the second act it's the human world with Mowgli. Uh, you know, again, another outsider coming into it and the jungle coming into it. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but, you know, I have to make decisions on, on the concretes, right? The lighting and, and set and what you see and what's on the stage. Um, and perfect. I was just going to bring this up that all throughout act one, it's in the jungle. So pretty much all you see is right. As you said, blues, grays, greens, browns, and that's pretty much it. Uh, when we get to, Act two, when he's in the village and in a room, in a bedroom, in a house for the first time, uh, I remember Bev came to me with a few wallpaper samples, and one of them was purple, which is right behind Kaylee, a nice purple color, and go, well, the purple one, because we haven't seen the color purple yet, and that just emphasizes that the world he's at is so different. And then it's like, well, what do you put in the bedroom besides, you know, a bed and a bureau uh, that, he, that he has not seen before? And uh, so right there, technology right in music um you know i mentioned last time that all throughout act one is just drums all the music is drums and jungle sounding music when he comes to the village in the second act uh right it's strings it's classical and then the classical is playing off the record here and uh 
And what else is in the bedroom? What else is in the bedroom, guys, that you can tell me is is something that he hasn't seen before that is just foreign and... and there's like a rocking chair, lamp. The lamp, right. So electricity and light. Yeah, I mean, that's intentional. I mean, of course, it would be in a room, but it's no secret that it, that, um, it could have been on when the lights came up, but Kaylee turns it on, you know, behind him. Uh, what else is in the room, guys? Oh, the bear, the stuffed bear. The stuffed bear, which is a nice yeah. moment that he's... He's able to immediately start making connections and say blue, right? Yes, blue bear. Uh, what else is in the room? A door. He's never been closed into a room before. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure, sure. Uh, what's on top of the uh, bureau? Oh, what is the that? megaphone? The books? There you want to go? There's books. Yep. There's books. So literature, and all that that entails. I mean, all the information that you can get. So there's books, and then right next to the books is what? You remember? I definitely poked at it when I went into the room during that scene. You knocked it down once, I think. If someone like, did. did. I? Did I knock it down? Probably. A, glo a globe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. You know, so that I kind of says now the whole world and, and information is now open uh, to him, you know? So, yeah. Um, just thought I'd mention those, those, those details. You know, none of that stuff is there by accident, you know? Um, anybody else on those things? Rocco? Um, is it okay if I slightly change the subject a little Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. So um, you're the best person to answer this question as the, um, the, the adapter of all these stories, but can you explain the Boldeo trilogy and what viewers <laughs> have to look forward to for the next two shows? Sure, we'll get there, and we'll certainly talk more about this with Little Princess and Aladdin, because at that point it was a decision to include the character Boldeo as the narrator, uh, since it seemed natural he's a storyteller, and... And there's similarities, believe it or not, between Little Princess and an, and an R version of Aladdin, uh, you know. Um, didn't I didn't plan on it at the time, doing Jungle Book, uh, to bring him back uh, two more times. Um, um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know, Rocco. I just, I didn't know at the time um, uh, that I was going to bring him back. Uh, it just seemed like a natural fit for Jungle Book, you know. Um, but what we have to look forward to is that he is the narrator and once again is involved uh, in the story in the next two plays, though there's some kind of continuity there. And again, there's a thematic continuity with uh, the child heroes and they have and the qualities they have of being brave and and kind uh, and using their minds. Yeah, Kaylee. I think too. Uh, I, I I love just talking about how brilliant you all are, but um, there's something to be said too for the performance that you gave Rocco and, yeah. and the kind of liaison you were between our world and the audience. And what a comfort I think that is um, because here we are, we're kind of diving into these really meaty um, pieces of literature. And like, that's such a, a wonderful thing to share um, with the kids, you know? And I, I think that's so important. But I think Boldeo made it accessible. And I think the reason for that was you. Like you, the performance you gave and, and the, the work that you did in the voice and the physicality. I mean, you worked so, so hard and you developed this persona that was, I mean, it was you and it also wasn't you. And, and that was such a gift to witness. And I think that um, just made these stories so my um My brother, uh once came to a little princess and he came a couple times because his daughter natalie was in it and i remember he turned to me at intermission once and was like that kid is like born to play that part huh <laughs> <laughs> you i mean let me throw it back at you rocco i mean what what was your experience uh, playing that and did you um when i when i told you that i was going to bring him back you know what did you think of that and i don't know yeah go ahead well, let's uh, let's see um i think that was the most lines I've ever had, I could say. Um, I mean, like also playing like Shere Khan, which had like like was also like a very very big character in it um, in itself. Um, but with the monologue um, in the beginning, and especially uh, the, the even longer monologue in the second act, um, because I had this um, this accent and this costume that's like partially uh, covering my face. And I'm alone uh, with the audience for the first part of the play. Uh, I had no choice but to just uh, become this uh, this character. And I I love storytelling. I really like being 
over the top and physical and being in all these children's theater productions that majestic theater uh made me grow into that and develop that and and um i like discovered my my love for that and uh the the monologue in the beginning is so uh choreographed with like with every movement i'm making every little pause was all <laughs> um all all planned and uh then of course the the giant monologue at the end um i had a movement for every, every um, for every part of the story, because the story the story is so long, and uh, of course there's lights and music, but I'm really trying my hardest to engage the audience, and especially like these little kids, trying to tell the story as much as I can. And um, I I know uh, Giuseppe, you might you might want to tell this one, but um, the, um, you're just sitting in the background as an elder. I remember you told me one day. Like your monologue is so long, I could go down to CVS across the street and back, and it would still be telling the story. <laughs> um, of, and of course, um, one one more thing I'd like to add: this being the the talk back for Jungle Book, I can't go without telling the avocado story, the legendary <laughs> avocado story. So right before I dive into my monologue, um, I well just just the beginning. I say, and all the animals in the jungle ate nothing but leaves and grass and fruit and like, <laughs> trying to think. So I think of the first green thing, <laughs> avocados, <laughs> and the audience roars. <laughs> it's so um unexpected, and and then I, we we get on track with the lines, and I'm going, but the oh my gosh. Um, and you can't, I was so distracted by that that um, like the monologue after that, I cut it like I, it, I <laughs> forgot so much. But it, it it was a legend, and I didn't eat avocados for two years after that. Now I love them. There were so many confused looks backstage. Real quick, so you said avocados because uh, Mowgli is typically jumps in and says, "And no meat at all," and cuts you off. <laughs> yeah, Nigani yeah. just kind of spaced on that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, at that particular <laughs> performance, so you yeah. had it coming up with. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I um, yeah, it's because uh, I say I'm listing all these things, and then I say and. And he's supposed and to cut no you off. And right. I had to think, avocados. <laughs> so that became a running a running gag. Does anyone else have any? Um, oh, go ahead, Carly. I see you up there. Uh, so Dora in our chat, first of all, loves all of our jungle backgrounds. Thanks, they're great. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> And uh, they also want to say that uh, our camaraderie on stage, it really showed, and it definitely is showing now, just in this chat between all of us. Were there any other good moments like that, like your avocado story or any other bloopers that you guys have held on to? Josh, you should tell the one about you falling down. <laughs> I was um, this isn't so obviously this isn't that much camaraderie between us, but um, <laughs> this, this one night. So there's the whole dance scene with the monkeys and the snake hypnotizes us. Cause the python hypnotizes us. Um, shout out to Cassie, by the way. Your your the movement in that snake. I when I watched it again, I was like, it's so fluid, it's so good. Um, but at the end of the dance, Ka drops like drops the hypnosis and we all fall down asleep. I guess. Um, one night I was just I was just real into it. One night, so I just <laughs> hit the floor <laughs> really hard. I gave this poor mother in front of me a heart attack. Like, oh no, are you okay? And obviously I have to be like up unconscious because we can't. So I just sat there. She's like, oh, I hope he's okay. Oh no. <laughs> hey, if I tell one one more funny story, I'll try to keep this one short. See, Boldeo has a tendency to ramble. Hey. So um, being uh, Boldeo and Shere Khan, I had some of the most, the, the craziest uh quick changes ever uh i i heard some people like making comments about like how fast can 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 this character just like change well can this actor change characters so fast and uh a lot of what we did is that we had uh we had the sheer Khan costume underneath boldeo's robe and just backstage i would just be changing as, as quick as i can and it was it was crazy furious time and i they were nicknamed Tornado. The rock -nado. The rock -nado. The rock -nado. <laughs> so one day, it was like the second time I come back as Baldea, right after being Shere Khan, I had my tail sticking out of my <laughs> pants. 
And then for some, like the audience is giggling. I'm trying to figure it out. It's like, oh, is it my beard? I do not know. And um, <laughs> then I see the tail falls off. And like these costumes are great. I love these costumes so much. I'm just telling this story because it's so funny that the tail falls on the stage and I just see it in the distance. Like I go up to it, I pick it up. I just throw it off stage. <laughs> Maybe just didn't have a tail for for the rest of for the rest of the uh, play. But I, I um, really wish I said oh, the tail of the jungle book. <laughs> hey. Yeah, you can see on the recording um, when Shere Khan first leaves the stage. You get to the edge of the stage and you're like, <laughs> Oh yeah! Oh my god! <laughs> I mean, no one notices that, but like me. Oh, one thing. Cassie. Oh, Cassie and then Kaylee. Okay, yeah, no, I was just going to say that something that I really remember about this show, not necessarily a particular story, but there was just so many variables, mm-hmm. as with many of the children's theater shows, but sometimes I forget we put these together in two weeks and with <laughs> the costumes and the lighting and the dance and the quick changes and the yeah. grass that's falling over. It, I just remember, especially about this one, having to work together so much and fix someone else's prop that's falling and tuck in that tail or whatever. Um, And I even watching it back this time, I was like, I love that all the animals are working together to raise Mowgli. And it just feels like a really like family show. And I remember feeling that backstage too. Yeah, I love using the the lines from the book in the play of like, um, just um, of Baloo and Bagheera and some of the other animals just explicitly saying, you know, I, you know, I love you, little brother, or, you know, mm. saying I love Mowgli, just so explicitly, so sweet. Yeah. You know? And yeah, I do remember, guys, it was, that was a tough show to put together. There's a lot going on. Um, and, but I remember, like, doing the intermission shift. I didn't ask you guys, but whoever was available just started helping me, and uh, uh, I think it was Jake, um, uh, move the grass off of the stage and, and help set up the, the bedroom. Uh, because we're in a completely different place in Act Two, mm-hmm. you know. So yeah, you guys are all very helpful and pitched in. Um, it's beautiful, Kaylee. Oh, <laughs> I was just gonna say um, on the subject of family. One thing I always like to bring up is that uh, there's a kind of a another continuity. Um, Dan, Josh, and I yep. tend to play families. Yep. <laughs> uh, I think more shows than not. Dan and I have been married, and Josh has been our son. <laughs> 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 Almost every opportunity, me and Kaylee are oh, and, I don't know. And, and I just love, in general, like, I mean, the, this group really has been a family, and and I, I feel so, like, kind of corny saying oh, yeah. it, but... There they are. Yes! <laughs> there are those crazy cats. <laughs> but, like, every time that, I mean, the couple of times that we've been able to do this, like, I I always feel like crying, just getting to see you guys again, and... and oh and remembering those times. And I'm so proud of, of how far we've all come and, and the fact that we're still doing this and, and we got to start together and kind of mm. grow up together, you know? Yeah, yeah. almost kind of feels like a family reunion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's always fun to see if, you know, I was saying this when we had the Sleepy Hollow cast together and it's like, I see you guys as a whole, you know, of just children's theater alumni, but it's always interesting to see this Oh yeah, this particular group of people, this order of people, is is the Jungle Book, you know, as mm-hmm. opposed to others, because um, it's just an intermingling and a mix. And yeah, and, and Cassie brought up a, a good point, and that is that we do these. Um, you say two weeks, and the kind of it depends where the order, what the order of the plays are, but essentially it's non-consecutively, perhaps more like a week to uh, about six or seven days. Mm-hmm. So it, it, these, yeah. it is put together in a week. So be proud of that fact. That's pretty crazy. I remember we ran that dance scene like one day for like uh, maybe 20, 30 times. (laughs) (laughs) That was was a long day, but no, it's fun. We were close to that dance, Giuseppe. We we had a a very good bonding moment because we had to dance like 10 times. Yeah, that's a great dance. I love the moment. It it looks so good. It really does. How Ka comes in and kind of like, picks us off one by one like it's all oh, yeah. it's all very smooth there's no hiccups and like there's so much going on you know like at one point like josh is dancing with blue or like i'm <laughs> dancing with bagheera or like there's some some like there's like six things going on at once and it all for a week you know like that's like that's the set piece right there and that like that was a crazy mm-hmm. amount of things going on on stage at yeah, one time I, yeah and i love when uh, mowgli and blue get caught 
at the center amidst all the madness and they're as they're talking they're still dancing and they're <laughs> still dancing so i don't know i can't stop um and of course the gag when all the monkeys pass out and the dance is over oh yeah baloo is still dancing i'm not hypnotized and was it nick, <laughs> nick does he still look at baloo he's still hypnotized and goes ah i was never hypnotized <laughs> um, i out in a room in boston where we're chuckling to ourselves you know uh, writing that <laughs> wondering about the monkey dance so we were talking about the music earlier about the drums in the jungle and the classical in the village yeah What's the significance of the jazz and that big band sound in the monkey dance <laughs> when we were writing that scene i knew i wanted to i liked um in the in the disney cartoon how the snake uses hypnotism mm. the snake does use hypnotism in the novel but if you if you blink you miss it it's kind of yes. It doesn't say it outright. It's kind of subtle about that the snake hypnotizes the monkeys. And uh, yeah, I wanted to also, you know, I love the what I Want to Be Like You monkey song in the cartoon, and, and that's a jazzy. So yeah, I kind of wanted the scene to feel like that a little bit. Um, yeah, I knew it, need, it needed to be a dance. So again, I mean, the. the Internet is just so amazing. Uh, you guys are just born into it, but you know it's just awesome that I can. I, we just spent an hour and a half probably googling um, big band, <sighs> jungle beat, you know, um, snake charming sound, you know, just keywords, <laughs> you know, and eventually found that one, and and we listened to it, and I said that works. And I forget what it's called, but it's some big band. And it sounded like like snake charming, snake coming out of the basket. It sounded like, mm. like hypnotism. Um, so yeah, it just worked. Yeah. Josh. Also adding on to that, it did kind of bring in that connection of because especially in the Disney cartoon that a lot of people know, he wants to be like you know the Monkey King wants to be man, like he wants to be up there with man. And so that jazz music kind of brings in that connection because. You know, the jazz music is more kind of like a, a human thing, and adding it in with this monkey scene kind of adds on that, like you know, he's trying to he's trying to be like man, so he like needs fire. And yeah. Doing all this stuff. Yeah, and think too, you know, the the music works in the sense that um, remember, Baloo is nodding his head at the beginning. That's really catchy. Oh no, we lost Steve. <laughs> That sounded pretty cool, though. Hey, well, until yeah. we get back, I have a question for you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially with Ani being so young, getting into this program, do you have any advice for kids who are maybe like too nervous to audition for this kind of thing? Um, I mean, at least what my mom told me is pretend like there is no audience. Just pretend like you are the character themselves. So just, you know, be you. Um, yeah, don't really worry about so much other stuff or getting the line out right. Just be yourself, be the character. Mm -hmm. Love that. All right, who else do we have here? Uh, Josh, I think I saw your hand up. Um, yeah, similar to Ani, you really just gotta, you just gotta be in the moment. Um, I remember auditioning as a 12 year old and it was terrifying because I was going for Pinocchio, but, um, I found it's really easy to just like, if you sit down and you really figure out the character you're going to be playing, it's, it, it can be easier to kind of get lost in the character and focus on yourself more than on what's out there looking at you. Because more often than not, uh, if you're really in the moment, you'll sometimes even forget there's an audience and you'll just be in that scene. You'll be that character. It makes it easier to kind of get through it. Yeah, great. Uh, anyone else want to jump off of that? I wanted to talk a little bit about um, like the connection that the animals share with Mowgli. Um, yeah, yeah. We were kind of talking about like the Monkey King wants to be like a human, um, but there's a part, I mean, all, throughout the, the show, like Bagheera and Baloo and like the wolves are like telling Mowgli, like we are brothers, brothers in every way, but blood. Um, and there's a part where when he first meets the Monkey King that the Monkey King is like, no, we have the same blood, we're cousins. Um, so just where like, <laughs> he uses like, brother 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 and then like when it's they do like the hand thing and he's like oh no we're we're related like we're blood related like we're cousins it's like oh like a little we're a little closer to uh what he ev eventually ends up with in the uh in the village and so 
does like Nick or, or uh, Giuseppe want to talk about the connection? Sorry, guys. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yeah. The computer yeah. shut off. I have no idea what happened. But... I'm so, like, my I volume hear. just messed up, too. Like, it messed up my volume, so now I'm just starting to, like, okay. hear better. Like, I don't know what happened. I think it, I had to unplug my mic. And like, no problem. oh my God, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> As we're running out of time, we can get, and just if, if somebody wants to talk about what, what Dan's talking about, that, and I just heard the tail end of it, Dan. Yeah, you're right. That's interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask about in the novel, um, Mowgli steals fire from mm -hmm. a village to combat Shere Khan. In the Walt Disney, the cartoon, uh, lightning just happens to strike a tree nearby. And in our version, he 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 obtains fire diff from a different means. And do you guys want to comment on what that is and kind of what's the significance of that? You know, why did we do that? Good guess. I, I noticed in our version, I I don't remember it from before, but I think it was Bagheera who said the fire is in here in Mowgli's head, um, and so that just made me think so much about fire as power and fire as related to knowledge and sort of humans yeah. power over these animals um, yeah. and keeping them all in their order. Yeah. I mean, fire, you know, they say many times, uh, and I mean, this is still true, you know, of human beings uh, and Bagheera says it to Mowgli uh, and other animals say it, the monkey King, you know, look at yourself. You have no sharp teeth. You have no sharp claws. You don't even have fur. You're going to freeze to death out here. Um, mm. So in every way, in every physical way, you know, lions and tigers and bears have a physical advantage over humans, but yet they're not the rulers of, of Earth, you know, man, man is. And why is that? It's because of the power of the human mind to do yeah. such things as, you know, figure out to slam two rocks together and make fire, you know, to have the mind and bravery uh, uh, to do that, you know. Uh, so yeah, so that's the connection there. I didn't like in the novel that he just steals it because he didn't create it. And I didn't like in the Disney cartoon that lightning just happens to strike a tree. Cause then, cause again, he didn't have really anything to do with it. That was just dumb luck. So I like him sitting there smashing the rocks, you know, man making fire. And again, illustrating the, the youth of his mind. Um, and it plays into also why the animals either like him or admire him or don't like him. Why Shere Khan hates him. I think it's because it's because of his mind and the fact that Mowgli can make a fire to defend himself and that man, as the Monkey King says, men make things such as these, talking about the dagger, and worse. And the implication there is like guns, you know? Yeah. So I love that yeah. the father comes in at the very end with a gun, you know, a firearm, right? You need fire for a gun to go up. Um, and Mowgli sticks up to the, for the animals and says, you know, don't, don't hurt them, father. You know, which is a great, it's set up at the end of act one that he says, because we were brothers in every way but blood, I won't betray you to men the way you have betrayed me. And that pays off at the very end. He doesn't, he could have said, go ahead, father, blow him away. But he's, you know, he doesn't, you know, because he's loyal to them, you know. And the, the other interesting thing too about why Shere Khan hates him, why the other animals hate him or admire him. Uh, you know, Kipling does this nice thing, which is I think a real thing, maybe not with dogs, but certainly with cats. Is like you you have trouble looking them in the eye, so that's kind of literally true. But metaphorically, that says you know that they can't see eye to eye in the sense that their their minds can't match his. You know, um, so I love that the whole looking in the eye thing, and how that plays into also all the way up to Mowgli looking Shere Khan in the eye at the very end. You know, anyway. Anybody else? Uh? Uh, tell me about uh, Tabaki as the news anchor. Did you get <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so fun. <laughs> that was a good scene. Um, I don't know. That was early on writing. and um, Yeah, I just thought it would be funny if he if he's bringing news, news of the jungle. And, and you know, talk about setups and payoff. It's, it's the news stories he talks about aren't irrelevant to the story. The first thing I think Tabaki talks about is... Uh, Pa shedding her skin, which is, which is paid off with, with the jokes about going blind, which is in the novel after shedding her skin. And there's some jokes made out of that. And then uh, Tabaki mentions the monkeys 
are close to figuring out how to make fire. It's, it's something it has to do with something and two rocks banging two rocks together. So that's a nice setup, which is paid off when when Dan, the Monkey King, mentions that all the way to the end of Act One when when Mowgli uh, hits the two rocks together and makes fire. So yeah, I thought I don't know. I just thought it'd be a funny little bit. Um, I don't know. It's kind of corny, but whatever. It's you know, it's for kids. And yeah. I thought it was interesting too the tabaki's the news anchor but we also have in the human village like they still want to share all the news gossip is still a thing everyone's yeah. involved in everyone's business and so i like that even though one group is animals and one group is people we still have these character traits that are coming up and you know all groups have that role yeah you know the I, the line at the end of the the scene where he meets the village elders uh, and he says I, i've left the jungle but i'm still among animals so this mm -hmm. idea that just because you're a human being doesn't mean you could have animalistic qualities that are that are negative, you know, and, and vice versa. Yeah, I find that scene very interesting. Yeah, and the animals they have like a council and they have like jungle laws. Yeah. Like how the humans would have laws. Um, yeah. But they are still animals, you know, like <laughs> there's a point where Bagheera still kind of snaps, like he's still an animal. Um, yeah, that instinct in him, that's something that, that riles up. Yeah. Anyone else, Carl? Is there any questions or anything like that? Oh, we are all out of questions, and we're also all out of time. Sure. So I don't know if you want to talk about what next week is going to look like. Next week, uh, so coming up next is a little princess, which is uh, <laughs> what's that? I yeah, think fantastic! I'm excited. Yeah, so all this, all this coming week, uh, you can watch anytime on the Majest Majestic's <laughs> website. Uh, uh, play a little princess which is semi sort of a, uh, a uh, has some continuity between Jungle Book. Uh, it's actually, it's set before the Jungle Book, but uh, Mowgli is mentioned and Boldeo the narrator is there. He happened to meet another um, exceptional heroic child that has similar qualities to Mowgli and that's Sarah Crew. And, um, and it's just fascinating, it takes place. We get out of the jungle, we go to England now, you know, and then, um, uh, it's the winter time instead of it being, you know, warm and sunny, and uh, and it's a, and most importantly, it's a girl instead of a boy. So it's the same qualities. It's the same child hero, but in a girl, which is nice, you know. So yeah, and then next Sunday, a week from now, we'll get that cast together and we'll talk about that play. Well, yeah, can't wait to see all, of them. <laughs> all right. Well. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in this week. And like Steve said, uh, catch us again next Sunday at 4 o'clock to join our talk about The Little Princess. So starting tomorrow, um, I want to say we're 9 a.m. That video will be available to watch. So at any point during next week, go right ahead and watch The Little Princess, and then you can join us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.